Welcome to Virgo Potens. I invite you to give this video a like and to subscribe to my channel. YouTube has introduced a great feature called Super Thanks. If you enjoy this video, you can support my work or say thank you by clicking on the Super Thanks icon. It's similar to offering support through a Super Chat. Virgo Potens presents SOS Sermons of Saints. The Sewer of Hell by St. John Vianney There is yet another form of wrongdoing which is all the more deplorable in that it is more common, and that is licentious talk. There is nothing more abominable, my dear brethren, nothing more horrible than such talk. Indeed, my children, what could be more out of keeping with the holiness of our religion than impure language? It outrages God, it scandalizes our neighbor. To put it even more clearly, loose talk releases all the passions. Very often it requires only one immodest or unseemly word to start a thousand evil thoughts, a thousand shameful desires perhaps even to cause a fall into an infinite number of other sins, and to bring to innocent souls evil of which they had been happily ignorant. Can the Christian really afford to occupy his mind with such horrible images? A Christian who is the temple of the Holy Ghost, a Christian who has been sanctified by contact with the most adorable body and precious blood of Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, if we had but some small idea of what we do when we commit sin. If our Lord has taught us that we may judge the tree by its fruit, you may judge, after listening to the talk of certain people, what must be the corruption of their hearts. And yet, such corruption is very commonly encountered. What sort of conversation do you hear among young people? Is there anything in their mouths but this kind of loose talk? Go, I dare to say it with John Chrysostom, go into the cabarets, into these haunts of impurity. What does the conversation turn upon, even among elderly people? Are they not trying to make a name for themselves by seeing who can be the most outrageous? Their mouths are like some sewer that hell makes use of to spew its filth and its impurities over the earth, and to drag souls down to its depths. What are these bad Christians, or rather, these envoys from the nether regions, doing? Instead of singing the praises of God, their songs are shameful and hideous. They are songs which ought to make a Christian die of horror. O oh, great God! who would not tremble at the thought of what God's judgment of all this will be. If, as Jesus Christ himself tells us, not a single idle word will be unpunished, alas! What will be the punishment for these licentious conversations, these indecent topics, these shameful and horrible images, which make the hair stand on end? If you would imagine how blind these poor unhappy people are, just listen to them talking after this fashion. I had no bad intention, they will tell you. It was just for a laugh. These things are only trifles, little stupid things that mean nothing at all. Is that so, my dear brethren? A sin so horrible in the eyes of God that sacrilege alone surpasses it in evil. This is a trifle to you? No, it is your hearts which are destroyed and corrupted. No, no, no one can afford to laugh or joke about something from which we should fly in horror, as we would from some pursuing beast which wanted to devour us. Besides, my dear brethren, what a crime it is to like something which God wants us to detest with all our hearts. You may tell me that you had no bad intentions, but tell me this too, miserable and wretched tool of hell. What about those who are listening to you? 
Do they have less bad thoughts and criminal desires after they have heard you? Will your harmless intentions stay the workings of their imaginations and their hearts? Be honest and tell me that you are, in fact, the cause of the loss and eternal damnation of their souls. How many souls are hurled into hell because of this sin? The Holy Ghost tells us that this ugly sin of impurity has covered the whole surface of the earth. A curse will fall. How is it that you are complaining that your animals are dying? Undoubtedly, you must have forgotten all those sins which have been committed in your outhouses and stables during the five or six months of winter. You have forgotten that the Holy Ghost has said that everywhere this sin shall be committed, the curse of the Lord will fall. How many young people, alas, would still have their innocence if they had not attended certain winter gatherings? Young people who now perhaps will never come back to God. Again, as a result of these affairs, there are those young people who, from associations which, most frequently, end in scandal and the loss of a girl's reputation. Then there are all the young libertines who, having sold their souls to the devil, now set out to rob others of theirs. Yes, my children, the evil which results from these gatherings is incalculable. If you are Christians and you wish to save your souls and those of your children and others of your household, you should never hold these gatherings in your homes, or at least not unless you yourselves, one of the heads of the household, are going to see to it that God will not be offended by what goes on. Once you have all come in, you should close the door and refuse to admit anyone else. Begin your gatherings by reciting one or two decades of the rosary to invoke the protection of the Blessed Virgin, and this you can do if you put your mind to it. Then banish all lascivious and sinful songs. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost, and these profane your hearts and mouths. Banish also all those stories that are only lies and yarns in any event, and are most often directed against people consecrated to God, which makes them more sinful. And you should never allow your children into any other of these gatherings. Why do they want to get away from you, except for the purpose of avoiding supervision? If you are faithful to the fulfillment of your duties, God will be less offended and you less blameworthy. Are your affairs going better? Another bad habit which is very common in homes and among working people is impatience, grumbling, and swearing. Now, my children, where do you get with your impatience and your grumbling? Do your affairs go any better? Do they cause you any less trouble? Is it not, rather, the other way around? You have a lot more trouble with them, and, what is even worse, you lose all the merit which you might have gained for heaven. But you will tell me that it is all very well for those who have nothing to put up with. If they were in my shoes, they would probably be much worse. I would agree with all that, my children, if we were not Christians. If we had nothing to hope for beyond what benefits and pleasures we might taste in this world. I would agree if, I repeat, we were the first people who ever suffered anything, but since the time of Adam until the present, all the saints have had something to suffer, and most of them far more than we have. But they suffered with patience, always subject to the will of God, and soon their troubles were finished, and their happiness, which has begun, will never come to an end. Let us contemplate, my dear brethren, this beautiful heaven. Let us think about the happiness which God has prepared for us there, and we shall endure all the evils of life in a spirit of penitence, with the hope of an eternal reward. If only you could have the happiness of being able to say in the evening that your whole day had been spent for God. I tell you that working people, if they want to get to heaven, should endure patiently the rigor of the seasons and the ill-humor of those for whom they work. 
they should avoid those grumbles and bad language so commonly heard, and fulfill their duties conscientiously and faithfully. Husbands and wives should live peacefully in their union of marriage. They should be mutually edifying to each other, pray for one another, bear patiently with one another's faults, encourage virtue in one another by good example, and follow the holy and sacred rules of their state, remembering that they are the children of the saints, and that, consequently, they ought not to behave like pagans, who have not the happiness of knowing the one true God. Masters should take care of their servants as of their own children, remembering the warning of St. Paul that if they do not have care for them, they are worse than the pagans, and that they will be more severely punished on the day of judgment. Servants are to give you service and to be loyal to you, and you must treat them not as slaves, but as your children and your brethren. Servants must look upon their masters as taking the place of Jesus Christ on earth. Their duty is to serve them joyfully, obey them with a good grace, without grumbling, and look after their well-being as carefully as they would their own. Servants should avoid the growth of too familiar relationships, which are so dangerous and so fatal to innocence. If you have the misfortune to find yourself in such a situation, you must leave your employment, no matter what it may cost you to do so. Here is an example of those very circumstances wherein you must follow the counsel Jesus Christ gave you when he said that if one's right eye or right hand should be an occasion of sin, one must deprive oneself of them, because it is better to go into heaven lacking an eye or a hand than to be cast into hell with one's whole body. That is to say, however desirable your position may be, you must leave it at once, otherwise you will never save your soul. Put the salvation of your soul first, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us, because that is the only thing you ought really to have at heart. Alas, my dear brethren, how rare are those Christians who are ready to suffer rather than to jeopardize the salvation of their souls. Bad Company My dear brethren, I call that man bad company who is without religion, who does not concern himself either with the commandments of God or those of the church, who does not recognize Lent or Easter, who seldom comes to church or, if he does come, then only to scandalize others by his irreligious ways. You ought to shun his company. Otherwise, you will not be long in becoming like him without your even noticing it. He will teach you with his bad talk as much as by his bad example to despise the holiest things and to neglect your own most sacred duties. He will begin to turn your devotion into ridicule, to make some jokes about religion and its ministers. He will speak to you at length in scandalous terms, about the priests or about confession to such effect that he will cause you to lose entirely your taste for the frequent reception of the sacraments. He will discuss the instructions of your pastors only in order to turn them into ridicule, and you can be quite certain that if you keep company with him for any length of time, you will see that, without even realizing it, you will begin to lose all taste for anything which is profitable towards the salvation of your soul. I call bad company, my dear brethren, this young or this old slanderer who has nothing but bad and foul words in his mouth. Take good care, my children, for this type of person has a poison of his own. If you frequent his company, you may be quite certain that you will imbibe it, and that, without a miracle of grace, you will die spiritually. The devil will make good use of this wretch to sully your imagination and to corrupt your heart. I would call that person bad company, my dear brethren, who is curious or restless or backbiting, who wants to know all that goes on in other people's houses, and who is always ready to form judgments about what he does not see at all. The Holy Ghost tells us that these people are not only hateful to the whole world, 
but are also accursed of God. Fly from them, my dear brethren, otherwise you will become like them. You yourselves will perish with them. Anger does not travel alone. Ah, my dear Lord, what melancholy company is that person who is a slave to anger? Look at a poor wife who has a husband like this. If she has a fear of God and wants to prevent her husband from offending him and treating her badly, she cannot say a word, even when she most desires to do so. She must content herself with weeping in secret in order not to have quarrels in the home and risk giving scandal. But, an irritable husband will say to me, Why does she contradict me? Everyone knows that I have a hot temper. You are hot-tempered, my friend, but do you think that others are not just as much as you are? Say rather then that you have no religion and you will describe what you are. Are not all who have a fear of God obliged to know how to govern their passions, instead of allowing themselves to be governed by them? Alas, if I have said that there are women who are unfortunate because they have husbands who are irritable and bad-tempered, there are husbands who are no less unfortunate in having wives who do not know how to say a single gracious word, whom nothing can interest or absorb, except themselves. And what unhappiness results in that household where neither the one nor the other wants to give way. There are nothing but disputes, quarrels, and recriminations. O oh dear God, is not this a real hell? Alas, what training for the children of such homes! What lessons in wisdom and sweetness of temper can they receive? St. Basil tells us that anger makes a man resemble the devil, because it is only the devil who is capable of giving way to these kinds of excesses. And I would add that anger never travels alone. It is always accompanied by plenty of other sins. You have heard an angry father using bad language, uttering imprecations and curses. Very well, then. Listen to his children when they are angry, the same vile words, the same imprecations, and all the rest of it. Thus, the vices of the parents, like their good qualities, pass to their children, but in more pronounced fashion. Cannibals kill only strangers to eat them, but among Christians there are fathers and mothers who, in order to gratify their passions, desire the death of those to whom they have given life and who consign to the devil those whom Jesus Christ redeemed with his precious blood. How many times does one not hear those fathers and mothers who have no religion saying, This cursed child, you make me sick. I wish you were miles away. This so and so of a child. These little brats, this demon of a child, and so on. O oh dear Lord, that such ugly and evil phrases should fall from the lips of fathers and mothers who should desire nothing but benedictions from heaven upon their poor little children. If we encounter so many children who are wild and undisciplined, without religion, bad-tempered and stunted in their souls, we need not, at least in the great majority of cases, search for the cause beyond the curses and bad tempers of the parents. What then must we think of the sin of those who curse themselves in moments of worry and difficulty? This is an appalling crime which is contrary to nature and to grace, for both nature and grace inspire us with love for ourselves. Those who curse themselves are like insane people who die by their own hands. It is even worse than that. Often they lay the blame upon their own souls, saying, let God damn me. I wish the devil would carry me off. I'd rather be in hell than the way I am. O oh, miserable creature, says St. Augustine, may God not take you at your word, for if he did, you would go to vomit the poison of your spleen in hell. O oh Lord, 
if a Christian but so thought of what he said. How wretched indeed is the man who is the victim of anger. Will anyone ever be able to understand his mentality? How about the sin, then, of a husband and wife, of a brother and sister, who spew out all sorts of blasphemies upon one another? They would tear out one another's eyes if they could, or even take away each other's very lives. So-and-so wife, or so-and-so husband, they scream. I wish I had never seen or known you. My father was a fool to advise me to marry you. What horror is this, coming from Christians who should strive only to become saints? Instead, they do only that which will make them demons and outcasts from heaven. How often have we not seen brothers and sisters wishing death to one another, swearing at one another, because one is richer than the other, or because of some wrong they have received? We see them nursing hatred all their lives long, and even finding great difficulty in forgiving one another in the face of death. It is just as great a sin to curse the weather, animals, or work. Just listen to all the people when the weather is not to their liking, swearing at it and exclaiming, So-and-so weather, are you ever going to change? They do not appreciate what they are saying. It is as if they were to say, O oh, so-and-so God, who will not give me the weather that I want. Others swear at their animals. You so-and-so beast, I cannot make you go as I want you to. May the devil carry you off. I hope a thunderbolt will fall on you. May the fire of heaven roast you. Alas, unhappy, bad-tempered people, your curses take effect more often than you think. But what should we do then? This is what we should do. We should make use of all the annoyances that happen to us to remind ourselves that since we are in revolt against God, it is but just that other creatures should revolt against us. We should never give others occasion to curse us. If something irritating or troublesome happens, instead of loading with curses whatever is not going the way we want it to, it would be just as easy and a great deal more beneficial for us to say, God bless it. Imitate the holy man Job, who blessed the name of the Lord in all the troubles which befell him, and you will receive the same graces as he did. This is what I desire for you. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book, Spiritual Warfare, Know Thy Enemy, is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you.